great good morning to all of you, and thank you for coming, all of you here uh, in this very um, overflowing space, and all of you online. Uh, really happy to be here today to moderate this panel about a very critical topic, uh, which we just mentioned about gender-based violence. The statistics are alarming. Um, but we want to focus this panel's discussion on things that are working and what we see as needs going forward and how we can address them. But to recap, gender-based violence occurs everywhere, in the home, uh, on the streets, uh, at the workplace. And it obviously uh, is something that is very prevalent. Um, just a few statistics about one in three women worldwide report that they've been uh, the subject of gender-based violence. It's obviously a human rights violation, uh, something that is really instrumental in holding women back from full participation in all of the other sectors that we're talking about today. Uh, one other thing, it has a tremendous economic cost uh, on communities, on businesses, huge loss in productivity globally. Uh, in the US, the, the statistics are that we probably lose $1.8 billion in productivity every year uh, based on work losses, people not coming, being able to come to the office, not being able to focus. So I think we need to really think about this problem in its entirety. The good news, and I'm going to introduce our panelists first and then go into some questions, is that there are things that we can do, and we want to really help you uh, be part of that conversation. And when you leave here, take action and connect uh, with each other to really make sure we're moving forward to address this problem. So I will introduce our speakers and then uh, start the questions. First, we have uh, Marina Piskakova-Parker, who's here at Vital Voices. Uh, I've known her for many years. She's been an original Vital Voice. Um, she is the senior uh, director on gender-based violence and does a lot of work here on other issues as well. And Marina started um, the first domestic violence hotline in Russia uh, in 1993 or even before that. So she's worked on this issue for a long time. Then we have uh, District Attorney uh, Mimi uh, Roca, who is the District Attorney in Westchester County, New York, which is, as many of you know, right outside the city. Um, she was a federal prosecutor for 17 years before that and I uh, was an MSNBC uh, correspondent um, analyst for three years. She ran for her office uh, to become district attorney, yay, and uh, she was um, able to unseat, uh, or to take, you know, to really move forward when people were telling her to wait her turn. So we want to give her kudos uh, for all of her work uh, running for office and stepping forward. And our third panelist is Alivelu Ramasetti. Uh, Dr. Ramasetti uh, works at Oxfam US. Uh, she is the Chief Gender Justice and Inclusion uh, Officer there and runs that portfolio. Uh, she's worked in this arena for many years and is really going to talk to us about what Oxfam and other NGOs are doing and international NGOs to address uh, violence against women, gender-based violence more broadly, so that we understand, again, what works and what we can replicate in, in other places around the globe. So with that, I am going to start with my first question to Marina. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the issue of gender-based violence and domestic violence. And embedded in that conversation is a lot around cultural and gender norms. So I'm wondering if you can talk about that, um, how we address those cultural and gender norms, how we think about naming the problem, uh, how we really break open the, the conversation so that this is something that people put on the, the policy agenda and also uh, really to address issues for people. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, you know, in my work with uh, violence against women and gender-based violence, I've learned things uh, as I was going, because when I started the helpline, uh, I was only trained as a counselor how to help, but not on advocacy, not on like really how to change cultural norms. But my motivation to start came from talking to abused women. And when one of them came to me um, after her husband beaten, to her, beaten her, and it was just like a woman-to-woman -woman help. It was not really anything institutional at that time. Um, 
So I see the crime, I see the woman suffering in blood. I called police, I called social services, I called hospitals, and everywhere I've heard one phrase, it's a private matter, we do not intervene. And it's been 30 years ago. Now, what do we have now? We have a full cycle in many ways. Um, and it is embedded in culture in sense of like, for example, recently with Vital Voices, we were preparing a training for um, some countries in South America. And one woman said, well, we have this proverb, like don't bring a garbage out of your house. And that's exactly the scene and proverb we have in Russia. So what's happening basically is that there is some kind of a so-called privacy or private matter that doesn't allow to speak about uh, violence that is committed in intimate relationship behind the doors. But the same thing, the same stigma, the same shame and blame we see with sexualized violence. So it is uh, an obstacle not only to effective implementation of existing legislation or passing legislation, it's also an obstacle for survivors seeking help because it still directly or indirectly puts a blame on them. Now, I've been thinking a lot why I've been working like I gave 30 years of my life to this. Why we still have it? Like why we still, you know, go around and why women get raped, beaten, why do we have it? And what else can we do? Um, and I was thinking like, for example, when we talk about domestic violence, in our advocacy campaign we would say something like, uh, 14,000 women are suffering from domestic violence. And it sounds like they're suffering by themselves. We don't name who actually does it. We make it too vague when we talk about crimes against women and other genders. We need to be more direct. And I think like uh, when we talk about violence, we need to say who does it, instead of saying that women suffer by themselves. And I know it will be maybe not easy to hear, because, you know, we had this campaign, I'm not afraid to say, in Russia and Ukraine, um, where women started talking about uh, sexualized violence they experienced. And it was very hard because uh, the level of hate from some men was really very high, blaming uh, survivors and victims. And I think it takes like two things. I think it takes uh, a responsibility, like open responsibility from men in, in like on the planet <laughs> to recognize that a lot of them commit that, not all of them. And there are groups that work with us, like Men Engage Global, like Equimunda. These are partners that recognize it and work with us on prevention of uh, violence. But I think admitting and accepting that it's happening, it's really important now. And the second thing is really speak more openly, more directly, uh, and not only in each community, but also at the global level. Thank you. We'll come back and have some more conversation about this very important topic about breaking open the sort of the private sphere um, or the privacy argument. So I hope we, we get to talk a little bit more about that. But I'm gonna um, turn to Mimi um, and really shift our focus a little bit, or maybe it's a continuum, to talk about legal and policy frameworks. And I know, obviously, you have been involved um, as a prosecutor and now as district attorney, and you do a lot of work uh, on gender-based violence issues and anti-trafficking issues. So I'm wondering if you can talk about what you've seen that's worked and what you, you see that's changed uh, 
at all in terms of the way that the legal system and the policy framework addresses gender-based violence, domestic violence, um, to give a sense of kind of where we're going with that. Um, sure. So I'm definitely going to pick up because um, it is uh, a continuum, right? So uh, Marina was talking about basically believing victims. I mean, that's that's really what we're talking about. And I will tell you that um, from a legal standpoint as a prosecutor, sometimes often in gender-based violence, gender-based crimes, the evidence is the victim statement. It, and that's it, right? Um, you know, there's not a there's not a video camera in the room necessarily. There's not another witness often, right? That's that's the definition often of of sexual uh, based violence. So as prosecutors, we need to view the statement from the victim, from the survivor, as evidence. It's not just a statement. It's evidence that we could bring into court. And so that's something that I think us as prosecutors, law enforcement, training police officers. Um, to understand that is is critically important, and judges who have to accept the evidence. So that's one sort of big legal issue. There are laws on the books in New York State, which is one of the most thought of as one of the most um, progressive, meaning uh, innovative, uh, forward thinking, you know, states in the country. This isn't uh, criminalized at the federal level. So this is up to each individual state, right? Rape, domestic violence, sexual assault, those are not federal crimes. I was a federal prosecutor for many years. It's very, very rare for those to have federal jurisdiction. So it's left up to 50 different states. In New York, which people think of as this, you know, bastion of progressive and innovative, there are laws on the books that are based in the 1800s common law, like the prompt outcry law, which says that if you don't promptly outcry about the sexual assault you just had, promptly, which is kind of vague, okay, which is based in common law from 1800, then it doesn't come into court. What? <laughs> I mean, you, know, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand that that is just archaic, and there are people trying to change that but there is resistance to it. There is a law about called voluntary intoxication. So if someone drugs me and I, you know, or 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 puts something in my drink and I'm intoxicated and they sexually assault me, I can't consent. That the law has made advances there. But if I have my own drinks and get drunk voluntarily, then I am capable of consent, even if I'm really not. And so the law does not negate consent, even though I may be just as drunk as if someone else did it to me, but they're blaming the victim there, right? I got drunk, so it's my fault. And, the, and again, there are people out in New York trying to change that, and there are people resisting that, including people who have said to me, well, but what's going to stop a woman from having sex and then regretting it the next day? And, you know, saying, getting drunk, having sex, and saying I was raped. That's what we're dealing with, right, in terms of the laws, in terms of the culture. But we have made improvement. And I'll go back to the domestic violence situation to, to wrap this up and give you some, some hope of some of the improvement. Um, Again, in New York and in many states, domestic violence very much is and was thought of uh, as a private problem. New York enacted a mandatory arrest law in, I believe it was 1997, around that time, where the police had to make an arrest, right? Because it's often a he said, she said, and very often the he said <laughs> dominated that conversation and, and the police would not arrest, especially if the woman in front of her abuser, and it's most, I'm generalizing, but it is more commonly women, if the woman said, oh, no, 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 everything's fine, because of course that's what they're going to say in front of the male abuser. Uh, so New York enacted a mandatory arrest law. I don't know if you heard about the case of Gabby Petito. It was you know, a case that gained uh, nationwide attention because police had an encounter with her and her uh, boyfriend in Utah um, where there were allegations of domestic abuse. They did not make an arrest. In Utah, it is very, very limited, the must arrest. So the police did not have to arrest. They had lots of discretion there unless there were signs of serious physical injury, which there wasn't. She had something on her face, but not serious physical injuries. So they didn't have to arrest. As we all know, she later ended up being murdered by her boyfriend. Had she been in New York or Colorado, which was only a few miles away, they would have had to arrest, make an arrest of both of them. And therefore, because there were cross allegations, she might still be alive today. So that is the power of what a law like that and training of law enforcement can do. 
Great, thank you. I'm going to come back uh, in a minute after uh, we, we talk about international NGOs to ask you a little bit about your interactions with civil society as, as part of your job, so just be, be warned. Um, but I want to turn to Aluvelu and ask really to give us the third, I think, part of this conversation um, is around advocacy. And obviously Oxfam is a global organization. Um, and works on these issues everywhere. So if you could talk to us about what you've seen from the Oxfam perspective that has worked, um, advocacy perspectives, tactics, to really push forward so that we can address the issues that we're talking about today. Thank you so much. First of all, congratulations for having this forum in the United States. And thank you for the privilege of being with you. Uh, I go by the pronoun she and her. and. Uh, Oxfam is an international NGO, humanitarian and development. As many of you know, it's like several other NGOs, sister INGOs. And we work on gender based, eliminating gender based violence, women's leadership, transformative leadership for women's rights, and unpaid underpaid care. And uh, in all the programs and advocacy that Oxfam does, almost around 60% of our uh, programs are around ending gender based violence. And also, we have a campaign in 34 countries around ending gender-based violence. And in US too, in Puerto Rico, Louisiana, and Mississippi, we have this. And our approach is mainly partner-led, partner-centric. So it's very critical to locate the issue within the context. So that's very crucial. Because as an INGO, the work is more effective if we connect, amplify, and advocate. So we are not here in the context. So that's that's what really worked. And whenever we say gender-based violence, as all of you know, it's different forms of violence, psychological, social, personal, uh, economic, different forms of violence. And also like uh, my co-panelist is just saying, the culture is so critical. When we say norms, like a woman, how a woman is dressed up, this is the reason for violence. So that's stated. We did a lot of research with our partners in different countries. Romantic love is again considered as a big root cause for violence. So then what is it that we, we, are like, we would like to address? Do we want to address harmful social norms? Or would we like to address the structural issue of normalizing violence? There is a huge culture of silence around gender-based violence. So as INGOs, uh, our uh, critical role is being a facilitator and enabler. And as Axwam, what we have seen is that long-term and partner-centric approaches with gender transformative uh, strategies was, is very helpful. Like we build our work around four pillars. Um, and the first one is strengthen the community base. That is awareness generation. Like we have our work in Bolivia uh, with Atua. It's a campaign where we uh, generated online awareness and working with youth is also very critical. As well as in India, uh, there is a Bani Naya Soch. That's 3.5 million community are reached through online. And also it's sometimes it's trainings and coordination. The second critical pillar in this kind of work is uh, working with the women's rights organizations, feminist networks, and coalitions. And that's very critical because they are the leaders of their own uh, choice, their own choice, their own context. They decide what suits, what are the issues. We are not there to tell them. So a lot of work that we did in Dominican Republic as well as Bolivia is around this. I'm just giving certain examples in the interest of the time, but you can always reach out to me uh, if you need more information. And the third pillar is policies and practices. How can we create institutionalized systems that are survivor-centric justice systems? And also, how can we help those who are implementing the laws to be, able to be successful? So like in different countries, we are working with the ministry, interior ministries, ministry of health, justice, educating them, generating awareness, Dominican Republic, Bolivia, and uh, in Mexico, as well as in India and other countries. Uh, and at the same time, at the community level, how do we work? How do we work with the community leaders to be more successful in implementing this in Malawi, Sri Lanka, Nepal, different uh, areas? What we see is working with the youth, youth-led, 
is very effective because there is a generational change that they're bringing, challenging, and also they're driving more and more change towards this. So those are certain approaches uh, that I see, not only Oxfam, even others, are engaging in addressing gender-based violence. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I think building on that, I, I want to turn um, uh, to Mimi and the Marina and, and uh, Olivelu as well, but I'm start with Mimi. Um, you know, the thing that about all, all the things we're talking about at this conference, but in general, is the importance of advocates, government, um, the corporate sector, you know, the media all working together to really drive change. And I think that's such an important thing. And I know the panel before uh, there was with uh, Ambassador Dyer, that was part of the conversation that we heard. And so I'm going to ask each of you to talk a little bit about how you see that uh, interactions with civil society or the corporate sector or, you know, other uh, sort of community based groups or the media, what do you see as something that you think would be helpful to highlight in terms of how groups um, and important uh, sectors and important institutions work together? So I'm going to start with you and then go to Marina and then Olivello. Um, it, it's so important, and it's it's really interesting for me to sit here as a law enforcement government person to hear uh, partners on the NGO side uh, talking about it from their perspective. Um, I have been part of um, a regional, in my area, a human trafficking task force, for example, that brought together um, police officers, federal agents, prosecutors, victim service providers who work with um, people who are actually suffering from domestic violence, sorry, I've phrased it the bad way, suffering from, um, who, are, who are being victimized. Um, and it's so important because those people would not necessarily sit in a room together. So you would not necessarily have the local police chief sitting in a room with uh, someone who that day met with someone who is trying to get, you know, uh, extricated from a domestic violence situation. Having them in the room together, having that connection um, is so critically important. Um, first of all, because when they have a case of someone who needs help, they, they know who to call, right? They, they actually have a human being to call. And those human personal connections I have found um, in my over, you know, 20 years now of law enforcement, um, to be uh, indispensable. But it's also critical because it brings a perspective that the other one doesn't have. So the, the person working with the victim may not trust law enforcement. And a lot of victims don't trust law enforcement, especially people in the United States who are from immigrant communities. And they may not have legal status, or they may not speak English. And so there are a lot of barriers to them coming forward and trusting law enforcement. But if the person they do trust now, the person who's getting them a shelter and you know a place for their kid to go to school uh, while they're escaping their situation, Situation, says, oh, I know the police chief. He's a great guy. I've talked to him or her. And I can reach out to them. And we, we should talk to them because it's, you, you don't want to just get out of it. You, we want that person to be held accountable. That's important, too. And all of a sudden, you have a connection that you didn't have before. Likewise, for law enforcement, to have the perspective of someone who is working with a victim to say, you know what? They didn't tell me this happened, right? Back to my example of the prompt outcry. They didn't tell me this the first three times we met. It took several meetings for her to come forward and tell me about the rape part of it. Why? Because she suppressed it. Why? Because it was traumatic. That's how trauma works. So, you know, let me educate you, law enforcement, about how trauma affects people's ability to remember things, ability to come forward. So those connections are so, so important. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, I actually became a prosecutor because my own mother was a victim of a violent rape um, in 1950, and uh, it was not treated like a real crime then. Um, it is now, but it's pretty much a modern development, even in the United States, that it is treated like a, quote, real crime. And the way to change that, the way to keep that moving forward, because it's still a problem now, is to have people who work with victims, first of all, talking to legislators, talking to law enforcement, and also running for office and being in these positions where we can do something about it. Very inspiring to hear it. 
Um, you know, I've been thinking as I'm listening also to uh, uh, my colleagues here on the panel and thinking about like all I know about gender-based violence. I think uh, what we are doing, there is so much of it that we are focusing on responding. And we are focusing so much on trying to help now and here to whoever we can help. And there is a prevention element that we do try all, you know, uh, to implement in different advocacy campaigns. Uh, but I guess it's just not enough what's happening. And um, we are working a lot with women with so-called public opinion, you know, like changing societal. But again, we need to work more individually. And I think, um, for example, working with men and boys, there are some great programs that exist. Uh, working with men and boys uh, on transforming actually what is called masculinity norms would be very helpful. And it is on, already on the agenda in many places, like uh, care work. We all know that um, care uh, domestic um, household uh, work division, things like that, they are already on the agenda even at the United Nations. But I think it is important for like every community to have this honest look why it's happening and start working on nonviolent communication. Not encouraging boys to fight, but encouraging boys to care the way girls are actually brought up. And it is transforming, it's not even about a culture, it's, it's really about norms. And another thing is uh, what I see around the globe, and I think it is a dangerous um, thread or trend that's happening. The conversation about traditional values. Because a lot of conversations around traditional values, they are substitution of actually tradition with normalizing uh, violence or normalizing control over women in many, many parts of the world. Um, and so, and that's why we have a backlash of, on women's rights, that's why we have attacks on gender issues. Um, so I think advocacy and not just advocacy, but really um, communicating with one another, communicating in a different way. Uh, yes, work with young people is critical, but it also, I, I believe that nobody is hopeless. And I saw, for example, men who come to uh, involve fathers groups in Russia, how it would transform them because they didn't have a chance to think mm -hmm. about their role as a father before they came to a group. So transition and transformation is possible. We just need to do more of that, I think. Well, thank you. And I'm going to give the last word. Uh, we're being told we have a minute left. So in a minute, um, give us a sense of how you see working across sectors with other, you know, other people who are interested in the issue. Okay, I'll make it very short. I think uh, there are no single issue struggles here. Uh. We cannot just handle gender-based violence in itself. It is linked to the economy, economic status. It's linked to the leadership, voice, and agency, addressing issues at the structural level. That's number one. And second is a multisectoral approach. If we are only dealing with gender-based violence, let us also look at the what are the other root causes that's causing this? Because it's not just about women. It's about women, trans women. It's about gender non-binary, LGBTQI, and also all those who are powerless and marginalized. So how can we do the transformative change is important. And there are different forms of violence that is emerging now, like the digital, cyber. So how do we address? I think it's best addressed when we are supporting the women's rights organizations, coalitions, networks, civil society organizations who are in the context as uh, we support them, handhold them through advocacy, research, and fundraising. Thank you.
Well, I hope you'll join me. I found listening to the panelists so inspirational in terms of really helping me think about next steps and what I can do differently. Uh, everything from how I talk about the issue to things that I can advocate for in my daily life. So please join me in giving them a round of applause, and thank you so much. Thank you.